Well, I see it's 10 o'clock. Do you want to start now? Yes. You really want to start? I'm not sure if I want to start. <laughs> well, it's nice to see you all and many people that I know. It's wonderful. It's nice to be back here to visit. And yeah, I remember you too. Oh. <laughs> no, I do. Well, you were all wonderful. You were all wonderful. This is a beautiful parish. And believe me, I remember my time here as being very, very enjoyable. And you know how you have to move on? That was how many years ago? 30 years ago. 30 years ago I was here, and then from there I went to Belgium. And it was interesting. But anyway, so much for that. Um, But since then, just um, my name is Father Garcia, just in case you don't know me. Um, and I have been on the run for a long time. So I went after this, I went to Belgium, Belgium came back, went to Santa Barbara at the um, parish, it was Our Lady of Guadalupe, served there six years, I think. Yeah, well, served there a while anyway, I remember that until 2002. I then took a hiatus, went and had my sabbatical, moved into the Archdiocese of Los Angeles as an Archdiocese and priest, and um, I was pastor of St. Gertrude, the great parish in Bell Gardens. After that um, came time that I, I uh, needed to change, so I went, I was very lucky, I had had some links with uh, Mount St. Mary's, not Loyola Marymount, Mount St. Mary's is the only woman's uh, university, Catholic university this side of the Mississippi, I think. And it's a totally, it was supposed to be a totally woman's college. Of course, we do have master's programs and other things in, uh, where the men come in. I play, I play, I, well, it's sort of at Shalon, which is right across from the Getty Museum, right? And um, we're always concerned with fires, of course, so is the Getty. We know that as long as the Getty stands, we will too, I hope. Um, but in any event, I've been teaching the, I've been teaching at Mount St. Mary's or working for Mount St. Mary's since 2003. Uh, but I've been full-time associate professor for five years now. So um, this year we'll see what happens if I promote it to full professor. We'll see. Who knows? If not, tough luck. We go on doing what we like. And I certainly enjoy... Teaching is my big thing, so I really enjoy that. Let's start in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Just listen to St. Patrick's prayer. As I arise today, may the strength of God pilot me, The power of God uphold me. The wisdom of God guide me. May the eye of God look before me. The ear of God hear me. The word of God speak for me. May the hand of God protect me. The shield of God defend me. All of the host of God save me. May Christ shield me today. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right and on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit and Christ when I stand. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks about me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to me or of me. Christ in every eye that sees me and Christ in every ear that hears me. Amen. I'd like you to say hello to the people next to you that you may not know. Hello. Introduce yourselves. (laughs) 
Um, overall, what we're going to do is we're going to examine the question of uh, Matthew says in chapter 5, verse 39, he says, okay, well, Jesus says, love your enemies. Possible? Impossible. Don't know. But in an age of, you'll notice we have all of them there, Facebook, tweeting, which I don't know how to do, YouTube, I use constantly for my classes, but you'd be surprised what else you find on YouTube. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. Instagram, that's where all of the young ones are. Are you on Instagram? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Tweet? How many, anybody on Tweet here? No. Well, we hear a lot about it, don't we? And some horrible things sometimes, too. People just seem to find anonymity wonderful. And lately, it's sort of like drop the bomb and move on, you know. You say what you want to say. I have the complete freedom to say it, and others just have to suffer it, and that's it, you know. And uh, you can respond to me. I'll just respond back to you with nastiness sometimes. It can be very good, but it can be very evil. So can Facebook. We found that out, haven't we? And YouTube, ooh, God, what's there? Sometimes frightening. And we have heard so much of people who have hurt other people who put their Facebook, you know, in complete presence of everyone. It's used, these things are sometimes used for revenge, you know. And I can see the effects on the younger people who actually are fully into the media. And those are not easy to handle, you know. Hi, you like that one? <laughs> this one is, you say to yourself, no. You know, I don't know where you are on that one. And it's interesting, you say, be civil, be courteous, love your damned neighbor. Excuse my expression, I never use terms like that. Are, are you kidding? After what he did? After what she did? Besides, what do you mean civil? Huh? Or courteous? Now, letting the other get away with it? I am raging at what she he did and has been saying, I can't, I won't let it go, I need revenge. Isn't that amazing? Ever felt like that a little bit at home? I'm sure you haven't. You're all saints. <laughs> have I? Mm -hmm. How many times in my life have I felt like that? Well, let's today, we're going to see, I'd like you just to think about this for a moment. And I'm going to put up your answers here. What does it mean when you say, let's be civil? First of all, let's be civil. What do you mean? Be nice. Be nice. Go ahead, but I'm going to keep these too. Respectful. Respectful. Courteous. Abide by the rules of society. Abide by rules of society, right? Anybody else? Uh, be fair. Wow. Say again. Turn to prayer, you say. Anybody else? The rule. Well, I heard one. Who was it? The golden rule. <coughs> Sorry, golden rule. Anybody else? Treat others. That's a golden rule, isn't it? We'll put a golden rule. And that one you find everywhere, don't you? In every religion, every possibility. Golden rule. It's not just Christian. Believe me, it's Buddhist. So I found out. Anything else? You got, have we at all there? Be compassionate. Be compassionate. Oh, I like that one. Yeah. 
Now, there's a difference in that and saying, okay, we've said let's be civil, right? Let's be reasonable, right? You be civil. <laughs> what does that mean? When we say, you, be civil. What are you saying at that point? Anybody? Shape up. Do it my way. Or see it my way. See it my way. Okay. Interesting. Say it again. Ah, get back. That's interesting. Get back in your box. That poor little doggy back there is going to feel very, very, uh, you know, I hate to say this, he's going to feel very uncomfortable now. Get back in your box. I said that to Heather, my little dog. Get back on your pillow. Get back on your, well, you can see my handwriting is getting worse as with age, right? E-O-X. Anything else? Back off. Back off. How do you like that one? Yeah, I've had that practicing that off. Back off. And how do you feel when somebody tells you, be civil? Have you ever had that said to you? Sure. <gasps> you have. When? Yeah. Father Garcia said it to you a long time ago. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. No, it happens. It happens, yeah. You be civil, mom. Yeah, be civil, mom. Pui. Ooh. <laughs> Teenagers. Well, I think if you then sort of say, oh, geez, was I being mean? I mean, then I think you make yourself look and say, what did I say that was so wrong? I mean, you know what I mean? They yeah. make you think. They make you think. That's very interesting, isn't it? It's fascinating. You know, the whole idea of civility is um, somewhat debated nowadays. There's some who... You know, say civility means having wonderful rules, going back to courteousness, going back to everybody weighing what they're saying and learning how to talk to each other. And then there's a whole group of people, and I'll tell you a few of my colleagues who are women, because I'm the only man on staff in in the religious studies department, who are very angry. And they cannot stand this word because they feel that has been used so often to them. You saw that previous one there? That's what they feel sometimes. They feel that at work or in society, the man has always had the say, and they are told to be civil. Um, And that has happened. We've seen it happening. I won't mention where or when, but... Certainly, the salaries prove it. You know, we still are at that inequality of salaries with women, which is you know horrendous. In one sense, they do enormous amounts of work, and they get less than than the, the males do. You know, but the question isn't even so much that we use the term. If you use a term, you have to use it, I think, correctly. But the problem is, you have these two huge groups that are saying, don't tell me to be civil, because you're, as you say, you're putting me in a box. There's, in the United States, there's this whole racial thing going on, where some say, you've got to be civil, and others are saying, why? You haven't been civil, right? You haven't been kind to me. You haven't been understanding to me. So that issue is, very controversial, and I think we have to question ourselves. In this Lent, because we are, are you all Catholics, sort of? Uh, I mean, I'm sort of a Catholic, I guess. I know I'm a priest, but does that mean I'm a Catholic? Who knows? Don't ask questions. Look at that one. Love, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Oh, come on now, Jesus. Bless those who curse you. Are you kidding? Pray for those who mistreat you. Not me. Uh, If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to the other. Are you crazy? If someone takes your coat, 
do not withhold your shirt. What do you want me to do? Go around in a bare chest and showing my pack of something? Um, give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. One of the, you know. Don't you ever feel like that? Love your enemies. Do good to those the Jesus there says. Certainly he doesn't mean the Romans. I hope not. Certainly doesn't mean the people who don't like me. I hope not. Or, you know, certainly doesn't mean my sister who has always demeaned me or my brother who has been such a louse because he's taken all the money that my mother had. Not me. This is a friend of mine, so I'm talking for. And now our mother is in the rest home and he has just emptied out her house because he has the, you know, the uh, power of attorney. She's sitting over there, Alzheimer's, and he's living it up. And we have to go and visit her every Sunday. He never comes. Have you ever had somebody like that? No people like that? Oh, it's awful. But the question is, how do you love him? Do you love him? I don't know, Lord. You know, the idea, there's somebody who has once commented the idea of slapping, which is very interesting. Have you ever slapped somebody? No, don't tell me. I want to know. <laughs> well, if you've slapped somebody, did you ever slap them with the back of your hand or the front of your hand? Front. front. That's good. You know why? Because then you treat them like an equal person. In this case, in the, in the um, time of Jesus, you treated a slave by the back of your hand, or even worse, the back of the left hand, which is not right. But what he's saying is there, and this was very interesting, I read the commentary on this, he said, you know, he's telling you to turn the cheek. Why? Because the next time he has to hit you with this hand, and he's making you an equal. You know, he may not realize it, but you have won the situation. Interesting view on that, right? So be careful, don't hit anybody with the left hand. Okay, but the thing is that you have that in Luke. In Matthew, you have, you have heard it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Lots of dentists have been working here, and so, you know. <laughs> but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And there it is. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. What did Jesus mean? What does Jesus mean? And there are many interpretations, of course. I won't go into them now. But the interpretation, one of the interpretations is just resist. And I just gave a talk in Tempe at the American Academy of Religion on precisely that issue. Can we use... And the word is forgiveness, which Jesus used, compassion and things like that, as a resistance to evil. And, of course, my result was, yeah, he can. We'll tell you about that later. Okay, what does Jesus mean now when he says, turn the other cheek or love your enemy? Let's take love your enemy. What do you think he says? What, is he, what do you, come on, interpret for me. You are my interpret. You are the prophets. Speak, O oh prophets. Love one another as I love you. Say it again. Yeah. Do you do that? Ah, great them. Yes, ma'am. How to be more graceful. I like that term. Because grace-filled and graceful, it's sort of like you know how to dance. You know what I mean? that grace allows you to dance. And that's what you have to do sometimes, don't you? You have to dance with people sometimes who uh, don't want to dance and force you to dance backwards on high heels, right? <laughs> now that is, it's, it, it's an interesting grace fill. Huh? Um, why do you think all the instructions 
All of the Gospels seem to insist on this. You have Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. My God. And we know why in John they were, he was insisting on this because uh, John's community, which was a very strange little community that went out of existence, quite honestly, they, um, they, they had people who were preaching stuff that wasn't what Jesus had said. And so they're trying to love these other people. In Mark's gospel, now that's very interesting, Mark is in the middle of a deep persecution. And he says, Jesus says in the gospel, love your enemies. What that means is, you've got to love your brothers and sisters who happen to be betraying you and handing you over to the authorities so that you can be killed. Because there was enormous persecution. That's why there's that question of the suffering servant in Mark. Mark's suffering servant is Jesus, you know. And people at that time needed to be able to identify with the Jesus who was handed over by his friends because that was what was happening in their lives. You know, the Gospels were written primarily for people who were in horrible situations, you know and needed to be able to deal with it. And that was one of those things that was dealing with. Does Jesus want us to be doormats? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, tell me. What do you think? Anybody? You're sure? He wants us to be... Okay, I'll come back to you in a minute. I want to know what humble is, okay? You keep that thought in mind. To be understanding. That's hard. It is hard. But, I mean, it's like when somebody, they say that bullies have been bullied. So, it's like if somebody is being a bully, it's for a reason. Absolutely. So, you have to try to even understand, can I take this person's body for having a bad day? I can't take this person's body. You know what I mean? Or whatever. Now, who has children here who have gone to school? Mm-hmm. Have you ever had to deal with your child being bullied? No? Yes? Yes. What happens when they're bullied? They're angry? Okay. Mama gets angry. And what do you do about it? Talk to the principal. Does that help sometimes? Ah. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the principle, right? But that is one of the major issues in the United States right now, bullying. You know, it used to be, oh, bully, bully. You know, it said, what's his name, President Roosevelt? Oh, bully, bully. Yeah, well, bully, bully ended up by being the bully of the world sometimes. And the question is, how do you deal with bullies? How do you deal with bullying? How do you tell your child to deal with a bullying situation? Do you tell them you have to love them? You have to understand them? Yeah, but look at my, you know, my black eye. And look at these wounds that I'm carrying. How do I deal with all this? It's important for me to deal with it. Right? You say hum- humility. Tell me about humility. Only God can answer a lot of things. Realize that whatever I want to do, it's what God wants me to do. Okay. Does what God want you to be bullied? Probably not. No. Let's just put it down. <laughs> no. But maybe he's trying to teach me humility. Maybe he's trying to teach me humility. Do you think that how do you feel about that, ladies and gentlemen? Nobody wants to be treated that way. Shall we bully her? No, no, no. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think that God doesn't want us to be put in that place. He has made it easy for us to come into a loving relationship with him. And that's what we can look forward to turn all things to good. God can turn all things to good. Now, one of the things that I ask myself is, how? How does God turn all things to good? Does he do it by, oh, let's call down a thunder and lightning on them? Or does he say, that person needs to 
to die, to suffer cancer or something. We wish he would. But does he? I mean, is cancer, uh, how should I put it, is cancer or any other terminal disease or not terminal disease um, or suffering disease, is that God's attempt to educate this person? I don't think so. You know, I mean, genetics is genetics. God started the whole thing, right? And he continues to. But through whom does he work to make change? Tell me about that. Somebody. Us. What do you mean? He works through us. For example, give me an example someplace. Any place? Anybody have an example, a good one? He makes us. There are two things, right? You're talking virtues, right? Which are... Virtue is a habit that we have to cultivate, right? On the other hand, the theological virtues, where God gives grace to those habits and strengthens us in the good habits. In other words, in the habits of how to respond, how to be with others, how to, um, you know, how many, all of you I know, do something for your neighbor. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. And God gives you the grace to continue doing that, right? In that sense, he may intervene. But I don't know about teaching you a lesson with heartache or having pulled your best friend away from you or having taken your husband or your child. You know, I think we've all suffered enough to know one thing that other people are extremely important, aren't they? In holding you up sometimes and making you, and dealing with your suffering. You know? If you haven't suffered, you just haven't been around much, have you? I mean, you might be five years old, but even five-year-old or, you know, suffer a great deal sometimes. And I guess humility means knowing exactly who I am, how much God loves me, and what I can do and what I can't do. You know, I wouldn't like to have gone off to Africa to deal with things. No offense, Father. I've done it before, but I haven't really faced a gun, thank God. And yet, it isn't because of that. And, you know, when I was talking to Father Aina, I heard how the brothers held together in that terrible episode that they, you know, and they needed to comfort each other and they, they needed to spend time with each other. And I think God didn't want them to suffer, nor did he use that to teach them a lesson, but he gave them the grace to live it. You know, because they had said one day, I am going to live for others. And they made a vow to do that. And it's not an easy vow to keep. So Jesus doesn't ask us to be doormats. I, I sort of, you know, that bothers me in the wind when I hear that. You know, and yet I hear it from a lot of people all the time. And I have for. 44 years, I think. Now, what's interesting is power. You know, what has happened? People use power, right? Have you ever gone to the DMV? I hope nobody works here for DMV. (laughs) Anybody work here for DMV? Have worked? I'm sorry. But have you ever gone? Are you on your best behavior when you go? Why? You don't want to make them mad. Why? They have the power. They have the power. How about the IRS? 
Ooh, they have the power. I'm scared stiff of, you know, I now have to do my own income taxes, so I sort of worry about that every year. But luckily somebody, a tax advisor, gets me free and clear. Maybe not that much this year, but who knows, you know, things are different now. But um, it's true, there is power, power in this world. Have you ever yield, wielded power in your place of work? Or have you, anybody, ever had to, get, were powerful people in something? Tell me what you were doing. I was a first grade teacher. <laughs> that is a... Don't mess with me. Ooh, <laughs> that's great. Mm, my top lady. And you know what? Mrs. Whitaker, in my first grade class at Ford Boulevard School, didn't have to use her power. She was so pretty. <laughs> oh, I fell in with my first grade teacher. I loved her. She was nice and pretty. And I hated to go. Not first grade. It was kindergarten. I didn't even want to go to first grade. I tried to fail it. You know, but, or, so whatever it was, I could go back just to see this gorgeous, lovely lady with long blonde hair. You know, you're right. Anybody else have a wielded power in this world? You don't want to say, do you? I know. And it's, it's amazing. When you wield power, you have to really question yourself as to how you're using it. And it's not always easy. But if you think of Jesus and his power, he had to learn who he really was when? In the Jordan. He goes there. You know, we think that, that Jesus was actually um, a disciple of John the Baptist. And he had been with him for a long time in the Essene communities. And that when John the Baptist dies, he takes over. But at this baptism, um, he learns who he is. It's a very powerful revelation to him. He hears you are my beloved son. He becomes aware of it. He's enlightened by that. And maybe others don't really hear it because we have all sorts of, you know, we have three different types of indications of what might have happened. But then he's sped off into the desert, isn't he? Why? In order to put that enormous power and his ego to the test. And who is to test him? The tester. The guy who is you know, the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And the first thing he says is, ooh, let's use your power. Let's get you some bread. I want you to turn those stones to bread. You can do it, you know. And mm, 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 the only bread I'm going to live by is the word of God. And then, you know, you have the, in both places, you have, um, you know, somewhere or another he's going to be taken and shown everything that, that you can use your power for, and says, go ahead, use it. You know, um, and he quotes scripture. You know, it's amazing how the devil quotes scripture and he quotes it back. And then you have the final thing where he says, all of this I will give you if you worship me. Mm -mm. You know, you shall worship only God. And the angels, and the devil left him, and the angels came to min minister to him. What does all that mean? It means that he had this real strong temptation to power and that he refused to use it. And then you have, he gave up power because he knew that wasn't the way. He knew it wasn't the way. And this is the, the thing that's going to afflict him all the way through. The dumb disciples, excuse me for calling them that. But they were in all of the Gospels. You look at them and say, my God, People, wake up. They go to the Transfiguration. Were you just at the Transfiguration this Sunday? Well, that was an interesting Transfiguration. You know, who knows what they were seeing? Who knows what they were dreaming? They, they sleep well, these guys. Um, you know, I mean, they're just there. But then they want to build up the, the, the tents. And, you know, that is an amazing thing. But the oddest thing is... Jesus is trying to tell him something, and you're not listening, that there is sacrifice when you belong to God. And, you know, what do they do? They start debating things as they go along. 
Ooh. Do you like to forgive people? Do you like to forgive people? Why do you like to forgive people? Well, it just gives me a, a feeling of freedom and liberation. That's true. Uh, do you ever, how many of you, and I'm not going to ask you, I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but do any of you ever re remind the person that you've forgiven that you've forgiven them? Mm -hmm. Guess what? You haven't forgiven them yet. It's not a question of forgetting here. It's a question of what? It's not forgetting. It's not using your power as a victim. Ever been a victim of something? Forgiven? Been wonderful about it? And what happens? I use it again. Look at the little girl there. Oh, she's not there. And look at the guy. Well, we think. And she has, it's funny how they put the, that on. It, should, it could be the other way, too. And normally it is, excuse me. Yeah. Where the guy has the thing and it's his wife over the head. Oh, I hate this photo. I don't like it. Do you like it? You know why? I, I do like it, I must admit. Why? Because it shows exactly the power of the word and how people hurt each other. And then you say, I need to forgive. You know, lots of people equate it automatically and dutifully going back into an abusive situation. Would you do that? Hmm, who knows? You know, if he really loves me, if she really loves me. Yeah, well, next step is the gun. The question could be that. When I was here in Santa Maria, I'm not going to say who, when, and where. I was a long time ago. Sister Linda, do you remember her? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful lady. I had lunch with her. We have lunch every year at the same time, same place at the Congress. Sister Linda was my associate, a wonderful person. She was great. And we were talking to, uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, whenever it was, anyway. And we were talking about a situation where uh, she and I had to intervene with a woman who was abused. We got her into a shelter. Then her husband came and somehow or another wanted her back. She went back. And this going backwards and forwards, she had a number of children, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And we kept trying to pull her away from this guy, and she could only decide herself. So one day we did try to pull her away, and it didn't work. And then I remember somebody called Linda to tell her, and then she called me saying that her friend who he'd been working with had taken his revolver out of the you know, drawer and had shot him. She'd been taken by the police. We saw her go through the trial. She was convicted of murder without any circumstances to, you know, immediate situation. So she has spent most of her life in jail. I don't know what's become of her. But she left the children. You know, the consequence was she left the children. And the question here is, do you go back to a situation? My spouse denigrates me. If I forgive, then I go back for more. But I do not want to go back for more. Thus, I will not forgive. Do you have to forgive and go back? No. Do you have to forgive and reconcile? No. I'm glad you've done that. That's fantastic. You know, some people will immediately say, yes, you do have to reconcile. You know, I have to be able to go back to the person, not only say I'm sorry, have that person say I'm sorry, and then we can be together again. And we'd love to do that even in our families, wouldn't we? Now, I'm thinking that I've been talking too much, which I usually do. We have uh, some time left. Forgiveness, reconciling, no. Sometimes in life your situation will keep repeating itself until you finally learn your lesson. Jesus realized he could not be reconciled with who? The Pharisees. 
he realized at a certain moment he couldn't even, in Mark, it was a very clear split with his family. He could not be reconciled with his family. Why? What did they want to do to him? You remember when Mary comes to the door with the rest of her family? They brought her there as a bargaining chip. And they say, oh, Jesus, your family's outside waiting for you. What does Jesus do then? He doesn't just say, they're all my family. He says, this is my family. He breaks with his family of origin. He breaks and he says, I can't go back. If I do, I'll put them in danger, myself in danger, and I have to get the message out. So he has to break with his family of origin. We say, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, in cultures where family is extremely important, you can have people hit you over the head a hundred times with the idea, you are still family to me. Blood. Have you heard that? Blood speaks. Mm. You knew that, didn't you? I mean, we do. You know, the Filipino community, the Mexican community, the African-American community, and all communities have a certain, certain element of, you know, <sighs> yeah. So now, let's move on a bit. But it's true, you know, you say to yourself, they hold me hostage. But I, you know, it's a question of, was Jesus held hostage? Mm -mm. Okay, here we go. This is hard. Look at it. What does it say? Somebody read that. What is the big thing in the middle? <sighs> There's this guy who, um, who sits out in front of CVS store where I am, where I, you know, where I go get my 15 prescriptions and 25 this and that, you know, and I get my um, vitamins that keep me going. I, by the way, I'm at the stage of imploding. You know, you implode after a while. You know, you look okay, but then, meow. Well, I'm at that stage now. So anyway, I, I go there, and there's this guy who sits outside. He's a nice guy. But if you give him a 10, where's he going to go and spend it? So I've just given him a 5. And he still goes in. But he's a nice guy. His name is Donald. I've gotten to know him. He has long, curly hair. He's African-American. He's sitting outside. He's a man who I'd like to talk to more. Would I bring him into my house to talk to him? I don't know. I'm still at that stage. Am I trying to include him in my life? Yes, a little bit. There was a woman that I saw on the street. Um, I was going to get off the freeway, and she was not just on the street. She was in the middle of the street, and she was pregnant and asking for money. I regret that I did not give her any, and I felt angry. Have you ever felt angry? I felt angry because... There she was in the middle of the street, breathing all that stuff and allowing her child to have, you know, that. Why didn't I stop and talk to her? Oh, the light, it's going, thank God. Have you ever been in a position like that? So you say to yourself, well, I give to charity. Well, it's one of the things that I've learned. You've got to, you know, when you earn a salary, you've got to proportion out and give. If I don't, I feel not only bad at the end of the year, I really do, you know. And then you choose other occasions to give without, without um, any tax return ticket that goes with it, right? Because you have to. And I say to myself, do I include these people? Can I include them? Do I respect them? Am I polite to them? Est-ce que j'ai la courtoisie? 15 minutes, right?
that, that well, you have two, uh, two paradigm ideas about it, so there's, there's infer, which is gentleness, and politesse du coeur, not just being polite, but having a politesse, politesse at the core of your heart, and that's what Enthusiasm is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in many ways. All these things about kindness and compassion, open mind and respect, blah, blah, blah. But are you actually, uh, have they entered into your heart? I'm, I'm going to add to that just a minute. You know, I have left the Josephites, right? I went off. And for a while, we were slightly estranged. But they have included me in many things. They've included me in their life. I gave him a talk two years ago, and we had a wonderful meal afterwards. It was really there, that spirit of douceur, something that has to be practiced. You know, that douceur means gentleness. gentleness. Yeah, I, I was trying to think sweet, but not sweet. It's gentle. And, um, you know, that is the thing that I think is really at the crux of the matter, you know, inclusion. It's not leadership, it's not, you know, teamwork, it's not, you know, citizenship. It's, I know it's all that, but I think inclusion is extremely important in civility. How and who did Jesus include in his family? Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Somebody tell me the story of Zacchaeus. Go ahead, Anybody? Anyone? Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus on the tree? Yes, go ahead. He was up in the tree. Jesus said, I see you come down. Okay. And could you tell me who he was? A tax collector. Were tax collectors very well loved by the Jews at that time? No. Why? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like the IRS. Don't ever tell anybody you work for the IRS. For, you know, arr, no. Oh, I bet. Sorry for the dogging. I didn't mean that. <laughs> Probably took it the wrong way. But um, no, it's true, isn't it? He really did. And so he has been so affected by Jesus, but he's a short guy, right? So he gets onto the tree, and he says, come down. I've got to eat at your house, Remember? So he had made an appointment. So he goes off and eats at his house. And along come the naysayers, the nice people. <laughs> Have you ever met nice people? They're so nice. <laughs> they obey every law in the book, you know, uh, except maybe the stops, lights, but that's another story. Um, but, you know, they... They are wonderful. The Pharisees were part of his... I mean, he was a Pharisee almost too, you know? So they're there. And what is Jesus... What do they say? Oh, you eat with tax collectors. And then the general word sinners. Oh, yeah, that one, you know her. Hmm, a real sinner. Look at that guy over there. He couldn't even keep... Um, the mikvah, you know, the, the, the cleansing that they had to keep. He has a shepherd with him. And you know about shepherds. Shepherds are thieves. Yeah, they can be thieves. I don't know if we have shepherds here, but anyway. Uh, shepherds are thieves, and they're dirty, and you have no idea about the sheep. Hmm. <laughs> you know, he's, you don't want to think about it. But... So he has all these friends who happened to visit him when he was a baby anyway. But the interesting thing is he says to them what? Who needs, who needs the healer? Who needs the physician? The sinners, those who are ill, it's not the people who are healthy. Who is healthy in that story? Who is the healthy one? Jesus. Jesus, but who else? 
Zacchaeus, he's given half of his property. He's now following him. He's supposed to be doing all sorts of things. That guy is in pretty good condition. So what is he saying to the nice people? What is he saying? Yeah, and you're not listening to me, so, you know, loosen up and listen up. Prodigal son, same thing. Saying, you know, I'm not going to go into all these. By the way, there's a wonderful woman who is written from the point of view of the wife of the dad who actually goes to him and says, are you kidding? You've given him half of our, you know, what we have to live on. How could you? Oh, you're a nice guy. You know, he deserved it. And then the other son, who is with the mother, says, hey, I've worked for you for a long time. Yeah, but you know, the father is a chump. <laughs> Which means, who is a chump? Exactly, God is a chump. In other words, he happens to like the people that I don't like. And include the people I don't want to be included with. Pharisees. Oh, the Syrophoenician woman. Oh, nice lady. Remember her story? She comes to Jesus. Nobody wants to let her in. He doesn't even want to talk to her because she is a woman. Male Jews do not speak to women. And women did not speak to male Jews of a certain age because you could be accused. Yeah, sort of like a priest nowadays talking to a young kid or something, right? We'll talk about that tomorrow. But, you know, the question here is, what? He, she comes along and she asks for a simple healing for her daughter who happens to be ill. And then, does he do it? Yes or no? Not immediately. What does he say to her? Now, first he says to her, the food... Uh, the food has to be given to the children of Israel and not to the... So what's he calling her? A female dog is not exactly... Yes, I'm not going to use the term. But he's using that term. And it's shocking. And she says what? But even the dogs, and she used the same term, receive the crumbs... Now, everybody says, see, Jesus was just testing her. Nah. He was human. He was divine. So what happened? He learned something. Jesus, as a human being, learns something very important. That the Syrophoenician woman, that the um, Samaritan, the good Samaritan, the Samaritans, Syrophoenician women, these people who are totally excluded from his company, have a right to his company. He learns that. Now, if he had to learn it, what do you think you have to do? That's not an easy thing to do when you don't see them around you. And that's why you have to go out. One of the biggest things that I've learned, oh, well, this is for the coming day. But I actually had wanted to, you, I had things prepared for you to speak to each other about, and I just hear myself going on and on. But there is a simple question. Um, for me, it's a fundamental question. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, it's not just emotions. It's not just pray for them. It's not just forgive them. It is go and be with them at times. Not always, okay? When you are not safe, don't go. But in the sense of being with them means, what does he say to the goats and to the sheep? In that famous parable in Mark, Matthew 25, where the Lord comes, he gathers the people, and he has the sheep on one side, and he says, go into my kingdom, you who, for whom it is meant. Because you gave me what? To eat. You gave me shelter. You visited me when I was in prison. You did all of these things for me. Lord, when did we do that for you? Whenever you did it for the least of these, my sisters and brothers. 
And he still looks at the other guys and say, go away, go to you know what. Why? Because you didn't do it. So my feeling right now is I want you just in the next few days, if you can, this is your little homework assignment, meditate on Jesus' inclusiveness during the day, even for a few minutes. Take one of the scripture lessons where he includes the Syrophoenician um, woman. I always like that one, you know, really good one. And then, or either that or the prodigal son or the Samaritan. Take your little Bible with you and read it and meditate and spend some time with it. And then try seeing people you dismiss or ignore or whose opinion you dismiss or ignore with Jesus' eyes. I know, and it's not easy, especially in this politicized situation that we're living in. But try it. Try it. And have compassion on them. And try turning off the media for one full day a week. Or even a day when going to or coming from work. And instead praying and talking to God. I, I, you know, I have a commute. Uh, 45 minutes one way, two hours the other way. Um, And, you know, I I actually take my rosary or my Jesus prayers. You haven't know what the Jesus beads are, right? uh, I can say it in English. I say it in French because I've learned it in French. It's funny. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have pity on me, a sinner. So that's the easier one because you don't have to remember how many Our Fathers and Hail Marys have done. But who cares? Just say the Our Fathers and Hail Marys like a mantra and let your heart be opened because I think Jesus works at times you least expect. So now think about it. What are you going to do? Are you going to do any of these? Tell the person next to you what you're going to do. Go ahead. Just make a little, if you can, make a little commitment. So for tomorrow, I'll check in on you again. Come on. Tell the person next to you what you're going to do. That means you too, Father Irma. Now, tomorrow I'm going to deal with a thing that maybe nobody wants to deal with, and so I'm going to ask uh, you to have patience with me. Oh, here, talk first. (laughs) Have you made your commitment? To do something? Anything? Tomorrow is something nobody wants to talk about. And I know, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk about it. I'm not going to have very many slides. But I am going to ask, this is a hard one. It has to do with the church. And everything we have learned about the church in the last few months few days, and I'm going to give you time to write down your feelings about what has happened and what you want to see happen. And the reason I'm doing this is because you need to say, you are the ones who are going to change things. And, you know, um, I am a priest, sort of. Uh, Well, why do I keep saying that? Because I'm more of a a child of God, I think. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be somebody who follows God. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, you feel like you're not belonging to the same church. In the sense of what's happening in the church with everything that's going on. So I am going to give you an opportunity to talk about that, if you wish. If If it's too hard for you or if it triggers something off, then you're welcome to leave at any time during that discussion. But we are going to talk about what's being done and what has been done and, you know, all of the terrible things you hear. Um, And I hear about them too. And my problem now is I'm retired from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. I'm still a chaplain. I still work full time, but anyway, I'm retired. And it's, it's sort of hard to hear that the church you've belonged to for so long is in such a terrible situation. But it's not just our church. It's not just our church. It's 
humanity. So I'm go- that's what I'm going to talk about, okay? Anyway, see you maybe mañana.